What's going on, everyone? It's Mike, it's John, back again for your match debrief. It was uh, Everton nil, Newcastle nil. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to talk about this game, isn't it? Because the quality of football wasn't great by any of the teams. They sort of, listen, I think we can all agree, you know, Newcastle have more percentage than us and I think they were the better quality team, but it was. I think the game was it was overshone by the penalty decisions. You know, Newcastle's one, and there was a lot surrounding Gordon and stuff, and then obviously he misses it, and the penalty that we should have had that wasn't given. And I've watched it back, and Dan Bear makes no contact contact on that ball whatsoever. So if I'm right in saying, I don't even think the referee was told to look at it. Now, that is shocking. If Everton are a Champions League teammate, I guarantee you that at least gets looked at. It's because it's Everton, and we all know the way the Premier League are with us. They didn't even bother to look at it. Now, for me, it was a stonewaller. But, you know, back to the game. It was shrouded in everything about Gordon and, you know, the penalty decisions, as I say. And it was just, it turns out it was a bit of a, a boring game, wasn't it? You know, like for the football side of it, it wasn't. It didn't really mean much, did it? You know, you come off there, and normally you could, you could talk about the game, but there's only really one or two points that we can talk about. Yeah, I, I struggled with it, and um, I've watched the penalty decisions back. I've seen, you know, I saw the stuff on Twitter about the uh, McGallagher, and I've saw the comments about former players. Uh, Neither one of those players are in control of the ball in the in the Calvert Lewin instant. Neither one of them are in control of the ball. So are the you telling the centre, me well, the centre forwards are apparently should get the benefit of the doubt? Now I don't know whether that's just offsides or as as a whole in general. But you know, you say none of them were in control of the ball. Calvert Lewin can't be in control of the ball when he's had his two legs tucked from under him. No, so, so that was the that was the point I was making. It's who, who do you deem to be the responsible party in that? And I, and I, I, for me personally, I've watched it back God knows how many times. And people are disagreeing the comments because they disagreed with me on the match reaction. But I think it's a penalty. I, I, I don't, think... I don't get how you can put a leg in the way of a ball that you're about to shoot, make no contact with the ball, and it not be a penalty. You know, if this was outside the box. The free Running kick. into the box and Ashley Young, for example, steps in front of you know whoever their left winger is and stops him from getting the ball unlawfully. You know, takes his leg or trips him or whatever. Then it's a penalty. So I don't understand why it's different when it goes to taking a shot. I don't get it. I don't. I don't understand the reason behind it's not a penalty. And I must say, I, I found it quite frustrating that there's been all this uproar about it on social media. You've got fans from different clubs saying it's a penalty, not a penalty. You've got the manager, uh, you've got the the referee coming out and saying, you know, Dermot Gallagher saying, yeah, it's not a penalty. Keep, Calvert Lewin actually kicks his standing leg. But yet last season and the season before, we both saw penalties for the same thing given against Everton. So whether it's a penalty or not, the point always comes back to consistency. Who knows? What is a penalty or not a penalty anymore? Now the, the now the Gordon penalty, the Newcastle penalty was a penalty. I, I don't have an issue with it. It was a penalty, and actually, I, I absolutely ripped into Tarks yesterday, and I'd stand by every comment I made. Senior footballer, experienced, and for no reason, it decides to rag into the ground. But even then, that incident is not interfering with the flight of the ball. It's not interfering with play. So we saw it literally that weekend where I think the same thing happened for Arsenal or Liverpool or whoever it was. And it Van, was Dijk, like, Van, Van, Dijk, Van Dijk's pulled someone down. And again, you go back to that weird consistency. Now you go back to Everton's penalty shout. And as you were kind of rightly pointing out before, <coughs> if that's outside the box and someone puts a challenge in like that, a free kick. You're given a free kick. So whether it was a penalty or not, and people have had a pop at you saying it wasn't a penalty or it was a penalty, whatever, at least look at it. 
VAR is there to look at it. It didn't even look at it, Michael. It didn't even say to the referee, you go over to the screen. When you watch the still of it close up, listen, you know where I sit. It was hard to see where I, I, where I sit, if that's a penalty. But when you see on Twitter or X, the close up and it's circled, right? The pictures we've seen from that angle, it's a penalty. Now, whether it's a penalty or not, from that angle, we think it is. From far away, you're unsure. At least have a look at it. That's what that's there for. And again, there's no consistency. Van Dyke rags, got, I think it was Gahey down. Nothing, nothing. And this is what I'm saying about certain teams are, are, are given special preference. If you're in the Champions League, nothing goes against you or you get given things for you. And it is, it's just about that word, consistency. The same rules should apply for every club in the Premier League. We're all playing in the same league. You need consistency for every team and treat every team the same because there's yeah. special dispensation for certain teams and we all know that and it's gone on for years and it's happening more and more and more now. Yeah, and, and I just, it, it frustrates me. It frustrates me that we don't know what a penalty is. We don't know what a penalty is. We don't know what clubs are more favourite. I just, I sit there. It's it, The Premier League over the last five years has gone from being Fairly soulless, but at least there was a bit of emotion. So almost just completely dead. I mean, it's just it's just completely dead. You know, you, we only go to the games because we love Everton. We don't go to the games because we enjoy football anymore. No. Uh, I, I, I enjoy playing football. I love playing football, but I don't have VAR decisions telling me if a goal's upside or telling me that I'm goal hanging or telling me that I've just flew through someone because it's just. It's just football. We just enjoy it. We play. We play the game with the boys, and no issues, no problems. But I, mean, I just find it all incredibly frustrating at this point. Football, and you know, I, I can I can truly see that the the love for the game is being sucked out, and the referees are awful. The standard of football. I think the standard of football it, it has gone backwards. You know, I watch I watch ticky tacky football from Manchester City, and I'm bored. I watch. Long yeah. ball football from Everton, and on board, I, I watch. I watch no football team to ever go. Oh my god, it's really exciting! I never look at anything and go, "Yes, that's brilliant football." It's just, it's just mundane. And 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 <laughs> but the thing, what what you're saying there, Michael, as I've said on here many many times. Now everyone goes on about the Premier League's the best league in the world, and for a long time now I've said it's not. It's really not. You know, when you look at. The championship, when COVID was here and no one could go and you had the championship and we all watched every game of football that we could. Championships are more exciting league than the Premier League. In my opinion, the Champions League's better to watch. You've got no prima donnas rolling around or very few. You might get it from the odd team who've been in the Premier League, but it's end to end. There's tackles going in. You know, you're not waiting for VAR decisions all the time. It's exciting. You know, the, the players are... are you know, the players are wanting to play in the game. And when you look at the Premier League now, and again, we've said on here a few times, it's a business now. It's not exciting. And for me, and the way you're speaking for you, and I think I speak for a lot of Everton fans, not all, but if sometimes I feel like it's a chore to go to the game. It's a chore to leave the boozer, to go over to Goodison to the game, because it's not exciting. And whether it's Everton playing Crystal Palace or whether it's Everton playing Man United, it's not the same anymore. And it's been ruined by these officials who've never, ever, ever played football, making decisions that are wrong and they're taking the enjoyment and the love out the game. VAR, for me, should be run by ex-professional footballers who actually know what they're doing, know what the rules mean and, and, and know how to make the right decisions and to see a, a right decision when they see it. Because these ones have never played at a competitive level. And they haven't got a clue what they're doing. They still don't know what they're doing now. How long has VAR been in place now? And they still haven't got a clue how to use it. Mm -hmm. And there's there's not enough players these days that, you know, get me up off my feet. You know, I remember when I was little, I'd, I'd watch Thierry Henry pick up the ball on the left-hand side and he'd beat three or four players. And you'd go, oh, my God, what a footballer he is. Or, you know, I remember Mikel Arteta doing it on the right wing for everything. He'd just glide past players. And don't get me wrong. There is players that are capable of that. We've got Lilliman in Dye, for example. But 
where are the Ronaldos of this world where, you know, you see step overs and beating people and either shooting or getting the ball into the box. And I just, I almost wish we could roll football back 20 years. You know, I remember as a, as a 12, 13 year old kid, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I just, it's just not the same. Um, I don't get excited on the morning of a match now like I used to because I'm going the game. I wouldn't do I wouldn't do half of the away games I do only for Frankie. I've told him that. Wouldn't bother me. Wouldn't bother me mm -hmm. traveling down to Southampton, leaving at half six next month. I'm probably getting home at midnight. It's for him. Do you know what I mean? But I, I didn't used to be like that. And again, there's no excitement there on match day anymore for me. Because you know mm -hmm. what you're going to see. Whether it's rubbish football, whether it's rubbish tactics, or whether it's VAR or referees that are gonna ruin the game ruin the game for you. Talking about the game, obviously we've spoke about the penalties and um, they've almost the, the the result a nil nil draw first clean sheet um, and the the fact that you know you could argue both sides could have won the game at times blah 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 I think Newcastle probably were the better team but the football is awful I mean the football he gets he's get, he's got away with it. Because of the last three, you know, we've unbeaten it three or whatever it is. But yeah. the football is appalling. And even in that Newcastle game, you know, Lilliman and Jai clears the ball off the line. Literally, it's off the line. I don't I don't quite know how he's kept it off out of the goal, but he's he's managed to sort of sort of inside of his back here or just get it off the line. I mean, it's mm -hmm. unbelievable, really. But the football is awful and the sooner I, i'm not trying to make this a, a, a dodge vendetta i'm really not but it, we it's got to change it's got to change because our best players are literally being bypassed do you know when you watch the football we're watching whatever and listen we're no arsenal we're not man city we're no real madrid we're no barcelona we all know that we haven't got the most gifted teams and players in the world but the players that he's got at his disposal michael we should be playing better football we should be playing better football with that squad of players. And as you quite rightly point out, he's bypassing a lot of the better players with the hoof ball, with the long ball, playing out from the back and, you know, giving it to the central defenders and letting them hit 30, 40 yard passes out to the wing. You're not using your, your gifted players, shall we say. The likes of getting the ball more to Jack Harrison when he plays or Dwight McNeil. I thought he was a bit quieter the other day. And die, we're not using him enough. We sh every time we get the ball, we should be looking for him every time, and we don't because nine times out of ten, eight times out of ten, we're bypassing him, and it's awful, awful football to watch. And you're quite right with what you say. Newcastle were the better team. If anyone deserved to win it, it was probably just them. But when you look at their team, and we spoke about this on the match preview. They've got a lot of injuries out. You know, they had Isak out, they had Callum Wilson out. That was a game Everton could should have gone for and won. And again, it was this, it was it was the the tactics that the manager used that didn't give us any hope that we were going to win that game against a weakened, fair enough, still a decent Newcastle team, but a weakened team. I don't think we we done the right things to beat them with the players that we've got. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, and the, the other one that, that I found scandalous in this game was the fact that Decor <coughs> stayed on Decor. Decor scored on stayed on the pitch for ninety four minutes because yeah. you know he scores a good goal. It's offside. I mean, it is offside, but he scores a good goal. Mm. But apart from that, what did he do? It does nothing, Michael, and we've spoke about this again. I've said he's gone colourblind as he's getting older. You know, he struggles to make a five-yard pass. I'd have no problem. I thought Garner Guy done well when he come on. I thought he'd done really well. I'd have no problem playing Tim or Mangala together, but he's still finding a place for Abdelou Decore at the minute. And apart from the goal that you said he scored, which was offside, and it was offside, he'd done nothing else. And I don't think he's done much since he's come back into the team. He hasn't done enough for me to warrant getting that starting place every week like he is. When there's players on the bench, the likes of Tim, who could come in, and we've said it on here, who can do what Decore does and more and more so you wouldn't miss Decore. 
to have no problem playing them two together. Or as I say, Garner guy, thought James Garner had a good game. I've been one, you know, I've I've been a critic of James Garner, thought he, he had a good game. Um, but again, they're the sort of players, James Garner, who are bypassing Michael. We should be using him more because he's probably the the, the player at the at the club who's got that pass on him or the defence split and pass James Garner. But we saw it a couple of times, you know, James Garner's playing right back. And even I think it was the 89th minute, he yeah. played a first-time volley 30 yards yeah. across yeah. the ground, skiddy, right into Calvert-Lewin's feet. How many Everton players have got that in the locker, realistically? No, no, no. Yeah, no, no, um, I know. He, he's the sort of player that Everton, you know, in, in terms of his passing attributes, can utilise, but we, we yeah. just don't. I don't. And I, I don't. I, I I struggle. I I am. I'm really, I'm really struggling. I'm really struggling with Dosh. I'm really, really struggling. It's it's not that I think he's a bad person. It's not that I criticise him as an individual. But I just, I really don't think he knows what he's doing with this group of players. I don't think he knows. Um, I don't think I don't think he knows his best eleven, and I don't think he knows how to get the best out of the players he's picking. Week in, week out, you know, and he again, I'll say it again, he's sticking with his stride and trusted the likes of Decore. You know, we've slagged this channel's probably been one of Michael Keane's biggest critics. I don't think he's done much wrong this season, Michael Keane. But again, Tarkovsky was a bit off it. That's when you're playing with Michael Keane. Obviously, that's what's rubbed off on yeah, Tarkovsky, but, in my opinion. Yeah, but we've got different opinions on that. Only, only because... I think Tarkovsky's been so bad, I would have dropped him over Michael Keane last week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would, yeah. I would, I would have had no problem bringing Branthwaite in alongside Michael Keane when mm. Branthwaite played the other week. And obviously, you know, he's out with an injury. Hopefully, he'll be back after the international break. But we go back to the, the manager utilising the quality that we have. Listen, we all know, we all know we're not the gifted team, as I said before, of other teams. We know. And we have, we haven't got quality in abundance all over the pitch. But some of the players who we do have, do have a bit of quality. And this manager still doesn't play to that little bit of quality that certain players have. Yeah, I agree. Um I think that's probably all on the game. I don't I don't think there's any it's I some people were saying about what what's my take on Gordon coming back. And to be honest, as I said when he left, and I, I've said I say whenever a player leaves, I'm not bothered. Look, I'm not I'm not bothered. We got forty five million pound for him. I I didn't think he was worth it then. I think he's probably worth it now, but I don't I don't think he's mega mega money. I don't, I think he is overhyped slightly. But you know, he, he went to a club that isn't struggling to a club that was playing in Europe at the time. So I'm not going to sit here and absolutely hold it against him. What I will hold against Gordon is the way that he left, the way that he dropped his, his tools, the way that he, you know, he, he, he didn't give his all for Everton towards the end. But then again, he's, you know, and whether this really matters or not, he's not a blue, is he? He's not a blue. He's a Liverpool fan. He has been his whole life. He's never hit it. Um, are you going to be that bothered? I don't know. The Barkley one still hurts me more to this day than what Gordon did personally. Yeah, yeah. Um, I tell you, you've got Newcastle fans on X having a pop at um at Everton fans. A certain Mister Carragher's had a pop. I think it was at Peds as well um, from Toffee TV. You know, saying how, how can the Carragher said basically how can Everton fans give Gordon abuse? And are we going to be like that for the next ten years when he comes to Goodison? Well, I'm sorry, Jamie. Did you not know this is our last year at Goodison Park? Um. The player refused three times to turn up for training. He refused to travel away to represent the club. As you quite rightly say, he downed tools. And I've said on here, I don't give a shit who it is playing for this shirt and this football club. Don't care if it's the best player we've got at the club. You don't want to be at the club. There's the door. See ya. And that's exactly how I feel about Anthony Gordon. Because at the time, I didn't think he was worth 45 million. I'm only echoing what you said. He's improved since he's went to go to. Newcastle, granted, he has improved, but I don't get the clamour around him. I don't, I don't get this. Oh, you know, he's left Jews, he's left the sinking ship, and he's joined us. Join what? What he joins? They've won nothing since 1955, and I'm, I'm not being funny. If rumours are to be believed, which you know you hear every day now, he was pushing for a move to Liverpool in the summer. 
So there's no loyalty from him to go up to Newcastle. He just wanted away from Everton, which, again, you don't want to be here. See ya. There's the door. Do one. Yeah, spot on. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to mention um, is not necessarily around the game, but obviously we have got an international break. Um, me and you have spoke about this in the car, and obviously I think if Everton hadn't have won the game, well, we'd picked up a couple of points. I do think Dodge probably would have gone in this in this period. I, I do. Yeah, I think unbeaten in three has probably saved them for now. It's what we do after this international break. When the takeover gets closer, you know, we've spoken on here, will they say to Mashiri, is a bit of money, pay them off if we start going backwards again under them before the takeover is official. But I think for now he is safe, you know, three, three, three games unbeaten. But it's still not good enough to keep him in a job beyond at least this season, Michael. You know, his contract's up. There is an option for the further year. I think you'd be a fool to put money on Sean Dyche being given another 12-month contract. Yeah, agreed. Um, right. I think that's it. I was going to mention one thing about some news about 777, but I probably should do a separate video on it. But now that I've said that, you're all going to be going, what are you on about, Mike? What are you on about? But if you read the report that, is, was it in the Times, the PBS? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, the the rumours are that the agreed money for seven seven seven, you know, the two hundred million pound that we owe seven seven seven, um, ACAP obviously have had to liquidate all of their assets and the footballing stuff, and they're, basically they've got to make as much money as they can because ACAP are also in trouble. But apparently, that two hundred million has turned into just sixty six million now. Mm -hmm. If that has happened, Dan Friedkin has pulled an absolute blinder because essentially he saved himself £134 million. Um, I don't quite know how this works because there are, there are caveats in there about they can own 10% of the club after seven years and they'll get a dividend every 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 year or whatever, which is fine. I, I don't have an issue with it. These people are much more experienced than me. But in terms of just the capital, to save one hundred and thirty-four million pounds is uh, is astonishing. Um, the future really is positive with this guy. Look, he, when I read that and I saw how much of a sort of businessman he is and how savvy he is, I thought, yeah, I like him. I like him a lot. Um, it's exactly what we need, and I'm hoping that he comes in like a breath of fresh air and just fixes this football club top to bottom. Yeah, I think he is going to walk through the door and the day he does. I think it's going to be two happy Everton fans on here when we're doing the video on it. Um, hopefully, November, come the end of November, beginning of December, the deal probably will go through. But listen, he's savvy and, you know, we walked away from Roma and obviously we, we spoke on here that he, he'd done it with Everton as well and he went back in for Roma. He's come back in for Everton. Obviously, he's probably got a sniff because I think one of the stipulations that made the deal look a bit, like it wasn't happening the first time when he walked away. A lot of it was to do with 777 and ACAP. You know, I think 777 are basically folded. I think that that's what we're reading. They folded. So whether they're still entitled to 10% of the club, if it's a business that doesn't exist anymore, I don't know. I don't know how that works. But if that's the case, we don't want them anywhere near the club, not even 10% worth. Give them their 66 million, get another person who we owe money to off the books and just let's start afresh with this football club when he comes through the door rip it out from top to bottom and start again because that's what we need and there you go folks that is a <laughs> yeah you, you, you match debrief to newcastle and everton nil nil um international break again I, I can't believe we've had two international breaks by October the 7th. I mean, yeah. honestly, I hate it. I hate it. Um, but I don't watch England, so it's uh, it's it's nearly two weeks without football, isn't it? Yeah, and, and the thing is, like, ordinarily, um, I'd be happy about that. Hmm. But I'm going to Miami in three weeks' time. And it's like, I'd, I'd, I'd rather be going to Miami now 
so I don't miss the Everton game, but we are. Been to any Premier League games anywhere this season? So don't start giving it that on here. I'm not, I'm not a very good fan at the minute. I must say. Um, I'm not a fan of you, so stay in Miami. <laughs> really, I'm gonna I'm gonna meet up with Joe, whatever his name was, Joe Joe Biden. And, yeah, <laughs> no, not him. <laughs> <laughs> My God. Um, right. We will see you soon. Hit the like and subscribe button. Make sure you follow us on all socials. And, uh, yeah, we will see you soon. Peace.